Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, first, I just want to say thanks to everyone that's here, um, all the sponsors, just all the companies. Like, this really is the start of a huge wave, um, and I'm just so excited to be a part of it and get to be here and talk to you a little more about serverless. So to talk about serverless really quick, let's just take a few seconds to talk about what it is. So serverless doesn't mean you don't have a server. It's really an abstraction away from you, right? So what is that? I have this block of code. It's going to do some stuff. I want that to run. But I don't really care about anything else. I want to make it scale. And I also kind of want it to do everything else in the cloud for me. And I don't want to think about it. And at the end of the day, I have money. And they'll take my money for it, right? So I have some code. Just run it. I'll pay you for whatever I use. Cool. That's the idea of serverless, right? Now let's, talk, let's kind of think of a use case of why serverless is something that's compelling. So ride-sharing applications. I'm sure everyone here has used that in some capacity, right? So what are the aspects of that? You have two basic services you need. And this is really breaking and oversimplifying this use case. But you essentially have the first service, which is requesting a ride. And then you also have to get a driver's location, right? But those two items, if they're built in something like a traditional monolith, we now have maybe different endpoints served from that monolith. And when we start looking at that from an infrastructure, this is really just me saying, hey, let's say it takes five minutes for the driver to arrive, right? So I requested the ride once. But then let's say my app updates the location of the driver 15 seconds, every 15 seconds, which is probably a lot less, right? So that would be 20 requests in that time for the driver to actually arrive to me, right? And if we start thinking about as the monolith is growing in its capacity, we're really going to be just scaling that out, right? This is just a horizontal scale. And so the whole concept of serverless is we can now break this down into an individual pool of resources that can now have scale sets inside of that, right? I want my resource pool to grow when it needs to, but I also want it to shrink so I can deal with more resources. Maybe there's some areas where the rides take a little bit longer to arrive. So there's uh, a little bit more requests that are coming from other aspects. Or in the ideal scenario, which is why everyone wants to use serverless, oh, it only took four minutes for the drivers to get there. So I want to use less of those resources. Now, this is really oversimplifying where we're taking a lot of uh, assumptions in here that like those resources map one to one as far as the load and the, and the data payload, right? So, but thinking about that, you know, we have this nice way where we can have this serverless architecture through our whole stack. But the main thing I want you to take away from today is that serverless isn't a silver bullet for everything, right? There are use cases where serverless doesn't make any sense. Um, and you really want to make sure that serverless is just another tool in your tool chest to build great software for your, and great experiences for your users. So let's talk about like, some of the pain points. Um, one of the first pain points is really around the cold start. Right? And so the concept is, with serverless, you actually have a container that's being initialized for you, and it is actually initializing more containers as you scale up. But inside of that, if we actually put serverless at each one of our pieces, there's a little cold start to start that container up for that first request. And if all of those chain together and we actually end up building out multiple serverless pieces in our infrastructure, you can actually end up having a long cold start really need to think about what's the application use case. How are my users going to be using this? Um, so I actually came from a background in Azure, working in Azure Functions. And uh, one of the things we actually recommended to uh, our users all the time is just use a time trigger and run every five minutes, and it'll keep your function block live, and you'll never have to worry about that. Right? So this is actually something that is recommended by cloud providers that you can do that. And actually, uh, in AWS Lambda, there's actually a template in there to do that for you. Right? You think about what is the cost of my serverless infrastructure going to be, right? If we think about it as far as requests, number of times that function runs, you know, typically you get like the first million free, right? So we're talking about 43,000 runs if we just run every five minutes. AWS, I think, just increased a 15-minute runtime before your cold start kicks in. Um, so this is actually a real option. But the, the point I want to make here is that there are options, there are things around here, but you really just want to understand what are you trying to do there. Um, but one thing about serverless that I do think is a great place, um, so we've had a lot of other talks about you know, this concept of GraphQL kind of being at the gateway. Um, and with Apollo Server potentially stitching together other GraphQL services, there's a lot of options in there. But serverless has a really nice place inside of this. Now, if we start thinking, like, what, what can I do with serverless today? So we have great documentation on AWS Lambda. 
It's fantastic. Um, I, I'm always very impressed with the docs there and, and the effort there. And if you look at uh, the serverless framework, they have great stuff of how to do it on AWS. But you know, to be honest, it seems like serverless is just kind of AWS's space right now, right? And so what about Azure? Raise of hands. How many people in here have used Azure or use Azure in some capacity? All right, well, it's like a third of the people in here. All right, so there's, there's something there. So why not Azure Functions? So let's actually get into a little demo. So uh, how many people participated in Hacktoberfest? Yes, awesome. <laughs> really happy that some people participated. So I did a lightning talk um, on Apollo Server at uh, Hacktoberfest, and what I committed, oh, this isn't even the right, I got to drag over. OK, there we go. I was like, huh, you see a blank screen. Um, so I, I made a, a commitment there where I wanted to work on Azure Function support for Apollo Server. Um, so I got up stage, kind of talked about that, and I started working on it. Um, and there's actually another community member, Leo, that I want to thank at the end of this that, that did a lot of work towards this as well. But the concept here is just like with AWS, we should just be able to have a handler that just takes everything from our normal config in Apollo Server, right? Everything should just work normal as is. Now, if I look at this, one of the big benefits and what I love about Visual Studio Code and the environment with Azure Functions is the experience for developers. So right now, we're actually going to start up Azure Functions locally. And it's great, because I just pressed a play button. You know, I, I came from a .NET background where you know, Visual Studio is a big beast, but there are some nice little aspects. And one of the things I love about it is this crisp experience that now we're just sitting in here debugging. And if I want, I can now come in here. I'll pull Playground up. Oh, I love Moon. It's the best. But I can actually come in here. And look at that. It's hitting my breakpoints right in my IDE. Now check out the call stack. I got my site. I actually can see where in my query, where everything's going through. And now I can also step through this and see how my call stack has actually changed. I have a lot of insight right in here. And I didn't have to do anything. Right? It is just an Azure function package. You can just start up a new project. And now you can start using everything with Apollo Server, everything we're showing you know, today, tomorrow, or yesterday, not tomorrow, um, is all available right there, because it's just all included in the same package. And the best part about this, too, is it's not only just that. You know, everything we were showing about Apollo Engine, uh, let's, oh, did I, I didn't hit through the breakpoints. That's probably the first thing to like, finish the request. Um, now, I am going to you know, just let you know, uh, the uh, service that I'm using is on a free database in Azure, so it runs very slow. But it should return its results. All right, so there we go. So this is actually just a simple application that gets all of the US site flow data for all our river systems. I love fly fishing, so I'm always really interested in like well, what's the rivers and flows going to be like today so I can get out there this weekend? Um, so I get this nice, nice context. And then if I switch over, I should see, yep, there's my request in Apollo Engine. All right, and so now just everything we were talking about, everything that was being shown, it's now all right there. All those pipelines we were talking about, it's all right there. So let me switch back to my slides real quick. Right, so I want to leave you with the thought process of, Right? Where can serverless fit inside of your stack? Right? We have this concept of, of, and you're hearing a lot of teams already doing this, of schema stitching multiple GraphQL servers together. Right? This is where serverless in a lot of various use cases can have a lot of value. Right? If you think about what some of those other requirements are around like cold start, um, it's very easy to work around that. Um, and lastly, I want to give a big thanks. I, I have no clue who Leo is. Um, so. I was working on Azure Function stuff, and then I saw a PR about, I want to say, three weeks ago um, from Leo for support for Azure Functions. And so actually, thanks to a lot of his work, it was much easier for me to um, finish up some of the other stuff, because you know, I have other things I have to do. The Azure Functions was kind of a side thing for me. Um, so I, I want to give a big thanks to him. And I also want to give a big, big thanks uh, to my wife, who let me sacrifice a lot of nights to uh, code. Um, but yeah, 
I just want to say uh, thank you. If you have any questions about Azure Functions with like Apollo Server, I'm very happy to talk about it. Um, and if you really want to just talk about GraphQL, I'm always happy to talk about it and share what we're doing at Apollo. Thank you very much.